Jeff Salzman here. In this bite-sized Evolver, Steve McIntosh and I talk with Thomas Bjorkman about what comes after progressivism. Well, that, that's exactly kind of get uh, place my point of that here in America, at least, I imagine to a certain extent in Europe as well, one of the things that we're working on is the relationship between this emerging uh, post-progressive culture, uh, you know, our label for it, and, and the previous progressive culture, right? Yeah. Most people who are attracted to this way of seeing things are coming from a center of gravity and progressive culture, although not yeah. all. Yeah. And yet we find that many people who are participating in that culture or attempting to show up and be part of this emerging new culture yeah. are still very much rooted in progressive culture. And yeah. while some see it as a seamless continuum, you know, we're just kind mm -hmm. of a maturing form of progressivism, we're also noticing the need for a, a bit of a dialectical separation, right? A little bit of pushing off and distinguishing between yeah. progressivism and post-progressivism. And yeah. I'd just love you to speak to that a little bit about, about how, how does this new culture we're uh, guarding for, how does that relate to, uh, to progressivism and what are the affinities and what are the conflicts? Mm. Yeah. So, so first of all, I, I, I think that um, what I'm arguing, arguing for um, might even be called hyper progressiveness or, or, or something like that, because the, the, the progressive, as, as that word indicates, is something that is moving forward. Yeah. Uh, and, I th and I think that we really need to move forward. And I'm, I'm even calling myself a radical in, uh, in the right sense of that term, meaning that we really have to go to the roots of the problem. And that we even might be so progressive and so radical that we are talking about a complete societal transformation. So, so ha having said that, the, the, the new synthesis, I think, from my view, is super progressive and super radical. But why do I still think that many of the aspects that we see in, in today's radical movement um, is stuck? And, and also in looking at the previous sort of progressive culture, the progressive cultures of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and 90s, perhaps, that, that that also is a bit stuck, um, or was stuck, or, or those of us who come from that field, why we do not recognize ourselves really in, in, in today's progressiveness. Uh, the progressiveness of the, of the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, that, that was very much a progressiveness still a progressive movement still within the modern or the modernist um, worldview. It being incremental and still a very, in some way, idealistic and ideological project. And, and certainly with a linear the theory of, of change, rooted a lot in, in, uh, in, sci in science, political science like Marxism and and when we understood from the postmodern philosophers that this was really a limiting perspective, including the Marxist sort of scientific understanding of, of history and the progress of technology and society, um, then we entered into this uh, postmodern space where you have a very, very strong and very effective critique of the, the modern way of, of seeing the world and pointing out the limitations of the, the modern worldview also very correctly pointing at uh, the hidden power structures in, in, in society and the important role of, of culture and of, and of the language. But at the same time, the more extreme forms of postmodernist thinking um, deconstructs everything and, and you end up in a very uh, relativistic space where you are really deconstructing all value hierarchies, all hierarchies. Power hierarchies, developmental hierarchies, value hierarchies. And when you do that, you, you lose both as an individual, but also as a society, you lose your compass. And I argue in my book, uh, The World We Create, that this sort of value vacuum, this lack of compass in the postmodern uh, world, in postmodern 
academia amongst postmodern intellectuals, uh, has actually made it possible for, for the market to take this very strong role now in society, almost as, uh, if not our new god, it is certainly our only meta-narrative that is accepted everywhere in the world. And with social media and the fragmentation of the discussion, I would say today that the market is really the only meta-narrative that is, is global and that is globally somehow accepted. And that is, of course, good news when it comes to the parts where the market is, is a good mechanism, a good self-organizing system to, to, to deliver directions. But in many of the most important aspects of, of the world, and certainly in our more existential questions, there, of course, the, the, the market uh, can't help us at all. And that has also led to the effect that, and Wilbur has pointed out this many times, and I mean, this is one of the fundamental insights in, in integral philosophy, that uh, deconstructing power hierarchies is, of course, good. You, you, sh you should see through them and you should know that many of the things that science or the market or other language structures that we are putting in place is just a way of hiding uh, power structures or, or at least making the power structures uh, obscure so that we are not aware of them. But when you also uh, attack developmental hierarchies, then you have a problem. And if you can't separate power hierarchies, domination hierarchies, from developmental hierarchies, then uh, you enter into a, a big problem. And I think that's where we see one of the big problems with the uh, progressive movements today, that if you don't realize the developmental hierarchy, you don't realize that culture can evolve and that we as individual can evolve, then it's very easy to get stuck on one of these lower developmental levels. And we all, of course, have many different models to describe our personal lifelong development. And as I usually say, all models are wrong, but, but some are useful, at least in some contexts. So if we should use some models, we should realize that they are all crude generalizations and they are all really wrong. Uh, but some can be, be useful. Well, a good model is one that lasts long enough to get you to the next one. Exactly, you know. Ex exactly. So uh, if we, for example, are um, in, in, speaking in the language of Professor Robert Keegan, the Harvard developmental um, psychologist, one, one of our most uh, recognized contemporary uh, academics in, in, the air, in the area, uh, he, he, he is pointing out that a very important step that we can take as, as adults, as young adults, or later on in life, is going from being in what he calls a socialized mind, where we take our direction, our values, but also our worth from an outside authority, from our group, or from a dogmatic religion, or from an authoritarian leader. And while we are at that level of consciousness, we, we really need that outside guidance. But then later on in life, we can develop uh, our connection to our own inner compass and become less dependent on outside authority and more becoming authors of our own lives in a deeper sense. And, and that level of, of mind and meaning making, uh, he calls a self-authoring mind. So from a socialized mind to a self-authoring mind. And if you can't see the need for this development, and then of course you have levels uh, above this as well, then it's very easy that you get stuck in your bubbles where you are very dependent on uh, that nobody uh, thinks in any, uh, any, any different way, that if somebody is challenging your values or worldview, they are really challenging your inner self. You can't really, at that level, separate your values and your worldview from yourself. And then it might even start to become important to protect that so you don't get, so you don't get offended. And then you sort of end up in a bubble of, of political uh, correctness with, with, with no challenging forces. 
And of course, every theory of inner development, I think every, stresses that in a for inner development to happen, you really need to have two things. You need to feel secure, okay? Because if you are frightened, if you are driven by fear, then your system shuts down. And of course, through evolution, if the tiger was hunting you, then of course, that was not a time for you for inner growth. That, that was just a time for you to run, <laughs> okay? So I, I think we have a ev strong evolutionary explanation that, that when we are in fear, then we rely on what we know is, has been working before for us. So then we are shutting down. But then just being safe, just being in a safe bubble, then of course nothing happens. Because you need this safe, this safe environment in order to let yourself be challenged and let your feelings be challenged, let your worldview be, be challenged, let your hidden assumptions be, be challenged. And I think this understanding for the need of challenging uh, perspectives is today totally, totally uh, lacking in, in many parts of, of the progressive movement. And then you, you are really, really stuck then both in the way that you are stuck in your own bubble, you are stuck at the developmental level where, where you are, and also the culture in your en environment is also stuck where it is. So you, you, you are losing this uh, de developmental movement that is so important both for uh, our, our own minds, but also for our ideas and for uh, society and culture, both the smallest culture environment in, for example, the university campuses or the societal culture in, in, in society at, at large. Um, so for me, the main problem with both the previous progressive movement and the present mainstream progressive movement or the new progressive movement uh, are that, they, that those movements are stuck in previous worldviews. The first one stuck in the post, in the modern worldview and uh, uh, the other one in the postmodern worldview. And the next level of progressive movement must, of course, uh, again, then come from a post postmodern perspective or an integral perspective or a meta modern perspective or whatever we want to call that worldview that I, th I think we have all written about and spoken about. And Ken Wilber has elaborated along with many other. People. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, e even Habermas and very traditional uh, uh, European and other philosophers are, are on to something here that we, we, we need to move, on, move beyond uh, post-modernity. But no. not rejecting, not rejecting, but rather, as you said, uh, include the positive sides and then transcend to the yeah. worldview. And um, right on. And, you know, how, however we formulate it or whatever we call it, um, an integral, at, at least, we see it as an integration, not just of the modern rationality, postmodern sensitivity, if you will, but also pre-modern or non-rational stages yeah. of myth yeah. and religion. Yeah.